Welcome to The Real News Network, coming to you from Washington, D.C. We're at the conference America's Future Now, and we're now joined by Terrence McNally. He's the host of his radio show on KPFK in Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us, Terrence. You're very welcome, Paul. So one of the things you do, you, know, you host a radio show, but you also give advice to foundations and not-for-profits about how to tell their story about their narrative yeah and here I'm giving you a plug as well for what you do but I'm asking this with the purpose the narrative of the Obama administration was obviously change you can believe in we were led to believe that we were promised something fundamental now when you look at what's happening there is some moves being made because of the crisis that certainly are a dramatic demarcation with the previous eight years but in a lot of areas I don't think, at least from my point of view, you're saying fundamental change, change you can believe in. So what do you make of the narrative, and then how is it playing it out amongst ordinary people who are being affected by this crisis? Well, it's interesting. I think that there was a, there was a narrative of the campaign, and that it wasn't. And it's like, I think if you go back even and like parse it, you know, the bigger promise was not, I'm going to do your policy, or I'm going to do progressive policies, really. I think the biggest promise was, I'm going to do things differently in Washington. I mean, if you think about it, he more said, I'm going to get, try to get rid of gridlock, I'm going to try to get rid of you know, backbiting and, and partisan infighting, and I'm going to try to bring people together because we have big problems to solve. And I think you know, a lot of people said people projected their own image, their own wishes on him. And, and I think that happened a lot. So my guess is, if you were a conservative Democrat, you may very well have thought, great, he's going to do my conservative, you know, whatever. And if you were progressive, you thought, great, he's going to do mine. Whereas really what I think he was saying was, we're going to try to get things done. Then, in the course, what, halfway through the campaign, the economy collapses, which may have led to his election, but I think on the same point, meant suddenly, Problem number one, issue number one, dwarfing everything else he might think about is how do we deal with the economy. So it's, I think it's a very odd test. Now, do we have change you can believe in? I think that there are lots of little ways in which, well, one, let's say in his claim, his actual promise, I think he's made his attempts, you know, for changing the way uh, the government relates to the other parts of the government, the way Congress relates to the president, certainly, the way the president relates to people. I think all that has changed. Now, in terms of policy changes, I think on foreign policy, not so much security policy, but foreign policy, relations with Cuba, relations with the Middle East, relations with uh, Europe, all of those, I think there is real change, and we're talking in where a very the, short time. Where is the real change? Well, with Cuba, he made, you know, changes which don't add up to the full, you know, the full monty of change. Well, but, pretty, pretty but, minor, because he went, to, he went to the conference in Trinidad, and the whole of Latin America told him, drop the embargo. Even the Pope has said, drop the embargo. So the change on, on uh, but, remittances is something, but e even, even some Republicans have been asking for, for that kind of change. Well, but I think, I think, the, I think the embargo will, will, will be gone soon. In other words, that's one where maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, well, but I do think that he, he changed the relationship of the well, U.S. Let, let me, and let Cuba. Let me but, pin this down more. Yeah. Uh, a fundamental part of his narrative of the election campaign and the early part of the presidency was that we're going to do something for the middle class. Yeah. Now, if there's a middle class, it means there's a lower class, and there's an upper class, or you can't have a middle class, which means you're actually acknowledging there are such a things as classes in this society, and our allegiance, he said, will be to the middle class. Then you have Detroit, where the, where they, the bailout is essentially a trash of, of auto workers, so where they're going to put the whole uh, risk of the health care plan into shares, thousands and thousands of layoffs, uh, the banking reform is a bailout of, of Wall Street bankers. Like, like the narrative about the middle class is, 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 is fading here. I, I have to agree with you. No, I'm going to say when you get to the way he has handled the economic crisis, the way he has handled the bailouts um, is, is, yeah, is definitely, you want to be a CEO. You want to already be um, in that top one or five percent when these bailouts are happening because that's who's getting, that's who's getting, you know, everything. 
And, and it, I mean, I, I can't explain why so, Detroit so, gets treated so much different from Wall so Street. So when you talk about the progressive community, the angry narrative is now being taken off by Glenn Beck and people on Fox News. They're, they're becoming the spokespeople for the anger about the elite. Uh, even though, I mean, the, you know, the prescriptions they would offer, if one actually digs into them, my own view is they actually wind up helping the elite much more than these policies do. But still, they're becoming that voice of that anger, where the progressive movement doesn't want to get angry. Well, I think, I think, I mean, if this conference itself, it seems to me, is so ambivalent. I mean, you know, as I said, in 06 and 07, Obama speaks here. So in other words, amazing, you know, amazing of amazings, one of our own has been elected president. So now do we cheerlead the president or do we challenge him to do what he said he would do when he spoke here in 06 and 07? And I think, I think, there's a, I mean, I've been at this conference before when, the, when it was anti-Bush, it was easy to be, I mean, you could feel in, all, in, 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 in plenaries and in rooms, you know, everyone knew how to feel, everyone knew how to get excited. And now I see everyone, do I sit on my hands? Do I get angry? I mean, I think this is a microcosm of, of, of what's going on. Now, you're saying that since people have to be angry now because their pensions have been wiped out, their jobs have been wiped out, or in California, so many things are just going by the wayside. And you're right that it is sort of the, f the, the, the crazy, I mean, I don't know where Glenn Beck is, you know, right, left, or, you know, on leave, you know, but he's, those people are channeling it, and I think the progressives are, are you know, they don't know which way to go. The, uh, and I don't know even what to tell them, you know, in terms of where to go. I have been saying since before Obama was elected that we really blew it with Clinton. In other words, everyone went, okay, our boomer president got elected, Al Gore's his vice president, we can go relax and make, make money in the, you know, in the tech bubble or something. And I've been saying since long before the election, whoever's elected if we win, we have to hold his feet to the fire. Are we doing it? How do we do it? So, I think that's so our challenge. So what do you think the narrative should be to be able to... to of him or of us? No, well, however you define us, who, whatever your us is, what should the narrative be? I think the narrative, oh God, it's, this is tough, Paul, because I think the narrative is, um, there's, there are apocryphal stories, I don't know whether true or not, that especially that FDR came into office with a moderate platform and said to labor, the farmers, the poor, and so on, make, make me, you know, make me do what you need me to do. Obama hasn't said that, but I think that is, you know, that's the story I'd like to see play out, is that we don't go on vacation, we don't become cheerleaders, we make him do when more. I, the, narrative, but I, the narrative I'm seeing yeah. at this conference and interviewing and talking to a yeah. lot of people, it's like you have, it's almost like Thailand, where you don't critique the king, you critique the prime minister. So here you don't critique the king, you go after Congress. You can, but, but nobody wants to lay a glove on the king. And then and, and this kind of almost deification. And, 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 and I don't understand how a movement of, the, of an angry movement develops if people aren't demanding of candidate Obama, a man, not a god, right. do what the hell he now, said he way, was going to do. I don't, I don't see that. I, I, don't, I don't say you don't, but I don't see people treating him like a god. I think people are much more uncomfortable. My ordinary people, I think, are getting increasingly angry, yeah. but I'm talking like in circles of the progressive political yeah. circles. But I mean, even there, I think, what I think more in the people I talk to is they're uncomfortable. They don't know quite which way to go. In other words, we don't want to tear him down. Um, and, you know. Well, that's the complication, because if this presidency fails, it sets the plate for a Bush, Rush Limbaugh, Cheney something. political party yeah. of some kind. some populist demagogue kind of thing would I think be, I mean, if, if this economic crisis continues, I think then we're, we're facing right-wing demagoguery, uh, you know, uh, on a domestic level, like we had right-wing demagoguery on a, on a foreign policy level with Bush. It's very frightening, so it has to succeed. And so I, d I think that's what keeps people from attacking him. And we're only, what, what are we, 120 days in, 130 Something days like in, with, with the plate, I mean, un since FDR, there hasn't been anyone that got a worse plate, and he got both a domestic and a foreign policy 
uh, crises. So I think there's something where you don't want to just take him down. And what you, uh, but I don't see people thinking that he walks on water. No, I see everyone just going, how do we handle this? How do we push him, challenge him, nudge him, and tell him if he's willing to be more courageous, we're with him. He's got, we've got his back. One of the things that I will say is that in the subtle ways that things are improving, let's say um, the window of what's acceptable to say on foreign policy, you asked me, Cuba was one. I think being very strong on the settlements is another in, 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 in uh, the Israeli-Palestine situation. A president, we haven't seen a president do that. So what was only okay for folks outside the beltway to say, he said it. So now people are saying it. I mean, Jace, you, you know, some of the more progressive Jewish organizations are saying it. There were even people within IPEC, APEC that are saying it. That's movement. And I think that's, I, it, I hate to be such an incrementalist when the challenges are so enormous. Well, incremental but I, is better than nothing. Exactly. But I do think that's where it's going to be. It's like when he's willing to, when he's willing to step outside what was acceptable before, support the hell out of him. When he's not, keep letting him know that he did. I think a good microcosm is the healthcare situation, right? In other words, I have, I think there is no doubt single payer is the rational solution to, to our problems in this country, and yet single payer is not, you know, we just hear it's not going to happen, and what we're told by the experts, et cetera, et cetera, is just support a really strong public option and that'll be the step to it again, incremental. And I have a feeling that's what's going to happen. Now, a substantial public option is revolutionary considering what we've been faced with for the last 15 years. It seems years. to be even in question now. And even in question. So I think what you hear at this conference, and I think that's one of the conversations I've heard the most, is don't you know, kill us about single payer when we need you to support us for a strong public option. And I would just say, just to those who are you know, listening, watching, and so on, Step number two, as far as I'm concerned, is make sure a Democrat gets elected governor of California because California has passed single payer twice. California, 35 million people, was the fifth biggest, now the eighth biggest economy in the world, has passed single payer twice. It was vetoed both times by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger's days are numbered. If we make sure that a Democrat is elected governor of California, I think we will get single payer in California and then all the scare tactics will have to face up to whether it works or not. I think that's kind of how it's going to be played for the well, next Arnold, year or two. Well, you Arnold, you heard it here. <laughs> Your days are numbered. Terrence said so. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Terrence. You're welcome, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.